Hello again all! Welcome back to the Knowledge Tower, where we investigate the science behind the Bionicle legend. In today's investigation, we will be taking a closer look at the mysterious properties of two common crystalline objects within the Matoran universe, the Light Stones and the Heat Stones. Like their names suggest, these crystals were sources of lighting and heating used by different species throughout the Matoran universe, obtained from mines and put to a multitude of uses. But how exactly do they work? Let's find out. We'll start with light stones. In the story, they are described as a form of crystalline protodermis that gave off a constant bright glow. However, it is also made clear that the energy they needed for this glow did not come from within them, but rather from an outside source. In the city of Metrinui, this energy largely came from the power plant beneath the Colosseum, with many light stones in the city going dark after it shut down during the Great Cataclysm. However, the majority of light stones in the rest of the universe got their power from the vast energy output of Cardanui, the heart of the Matoran universe and the source of the energy storms that kept the whole universe running. A key feature of light stones is that they do not need to be directly connected to their power source in order to function. Unlike the majority of the lighting technology used by humans, there is no need to have the light stones directly connected to their power source with wires or other such methods. Light stones instead are separate units. So, when looking at real world examples, what we need is a substance that absorbs outside energy from the environment, stores that energy, and then releases it as light. While a light stone is technically an artificial light source, given that the whole Matoran universe is an artificial creation by the great beings, we will avoid artificial methods of explaining how light stones could work in this video. Humans have invented many, many different kinds of artificial lighting after all, and it would take far too long to cover all the possibilities that could apply to the light stones in one video. Instead, we will be looking at the natural world for answers. Are there any processes that occur in nature that can give our light stones the attributes we need? After much research, two related phenomena were settled upon as being our best bet, fluorescence and phosphorescence. Substances that display these phenomena are known as phosphors. When a phosphor is exposed to a source of electromagnetic radiation, its atoms absorb some of that radiation the electrons of the atom moving to a higher or excited energy state. This is an inherently unstable arrangement, and so the electrons release the stored energy by re-emitting the electromagnetic radiation at a longer wavelength, allowing the atom to return to its previous lower energy state. The main difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence are the time scales on which this re-emission occurs. Fluorescent materials stop glowing the instant the radiation source is removed, whereas phosphorescent materials can continue to glow for longer periods, ranging from seconds to hours after the radiation is removed, depending on the exact chemistry of the material. This time delay occurs because of a defect in the crystal lattice of the phosphor. When the electron absorbs the high energy radiation and enters its excited state, a defect such as a missing atom in the structure of the substance can act like a pitfall, trapping the electron and storing the absorbed energy until it is released by a random vibration of the atoms. An example of fluorescence you may be familiar with is the glowing of certain fabrics under a black light, with the phosphors within the fabric absorbing the invisible UV light from the black light and re-emitting it as visible light, causing the garment to glow. There are many different natural minerals that glow in this way too, such as calcite, fluorite, or sodalite. As for an example of phosphorescence, well, that is something that Bionicle fans should be very familiar with, as it is the mechanism behind the glow-in-the-dark plastics, such as those used in Kanoka discs. We don't know specifically from the story how long it took the light stones to lose their function after the energy stopped flowing from Cardanui so we can't say for certain which of these two methods best describes the light stones, so we will have to accept them both as possibilities for the purposes of this video. Also, one thing to note here is that while both of these processes do produce a glow, 
it is a relatively weak glow compared to the brightness that the light stones are described as having. But protodermis is a substance of extremes after all, so this can be accounted for by suggesting that the protodermic version of this process is far more efficient and brighter than the version we have with normal matter here on Earth. While Greg and the Bionicle Story team have always been reluctant to give the specifics on the kind of energy Cardinui produces, we do know that it permeates the whole GSR and the Matoran universe within, meaning that the light stones are constantly bathed in it as long as Cardinui is producing power. So, for the purposes of this video, let's say that whatever magical sci-fi energy this is, it acts in a similar way to electromagnetic radiation, with various wavelengths that carry different energy levels. So, this is my suggestion for how light stones work. High energy Cardinui radiation permeates the Matoran universe, with the light stones absorbing this energy to excite the atoms within their crystalline structures. These excited atoms then re-release that energy in the lower wavelength form of visible light, allowing the light stones to have their continuous glow. Then, when Cardinui eventually shut down for good, so did the light stones, either immediately if they relied upon fluorescence, or slowly dimming to nothing if they use phosphorescence. Now that we have covered the light stones, let's take a closer look at their cousins, the heat stones. Like how light stones produce a constant source of light, heat stones are shown in the story as providing a constant source of heat. Theoretically, these could work in much the same way as the light stones, simply re-releasing their absorbed energy from Cardinui as the longer wavelength infrared radiation instead of visible light. However, one interesting piece of information about the heat stones is that while they are related to light stones, they derive their power from a different source. So, if they don't get their energy from Cardinui, where do they get it from? One interesting possible answer is that they do not get their energy from an outside source at all, but rather from within themselves. Taking that into consideration, there is one obvious choice for how the heat stones could generate heat without an outside energy source. Radioactivity. Radioactive atoms are inherently unstable, and as such they emit energy in the form of radiation in order to decay into a more stable element. During this decay, heat is produced as a byproduct, with the energy of the radiation being converted into the thermal movement of atoms. This decay heat is in fact a key factor of many processes here on Earth, with this heat being partially responsible for the energy that drives volcanoes and plate tectonics. The radiation from nuclear decay can be categorised into three main types. The first are alpha particles. These are made of two protons and two neutrons from the original atom's nucleus. They are very energetic particles, however they are also relatively massive, and so use up their energy over short distances and are therefore unable to travel very far from the original atom. In terms of danger to living things, alpha particles do not have the energy to penetrate even the first layer of skin, so they are only really dangerous if an alpha emitter is able to enter the body and get close to sensitive cells. The second type are beta particles. These are electrons or positrons emitted from an atom during decay. They are also very energetic, but are less massive than the alpha particles, and so are able to travel further and penetrate deeper into the bodies of living things. However, they are still able to be stopped by clothing or a thin layer of other substances such as aluminium. The third type are gamma rays. These are photons of very high energy electromagnetic radiation and can travel through even several centimetres of a dense material like lead with ease, making them very dangerous to living things due to the damage to living tissue they cause. Of these three types, alpha particles are our best bet for the type of radiation we would want our heat stones to emit. Due to the high energy but low penetration that these particles provide, they are the most suited to transferring the energy of the radioactive decay into heat without causing any unnecessary danger to the users of the heat stones themselves. This could be further aided by having the radioactive form of protodermis in the centre of the heat stone with a non-radioactive layer around it, 
with the non-radioactive layer absorbing the alpha particles to generate the heat, as well as acting as a barrier to ensure no alpha particles escaped into the space around the heat stone. We would also need this alpha-emitting form of protodermis to have a long half-life in order for the heat stones to still be able to produce useful amounts of heat over the full 100,000-year timescale of the Bionicle storyline. Heat stones and light stones are a common sight throughout the Bionicle story, a useful piece of world-building to replace technological lighting and heating in this fantasy world. But like many aspects of Bionicle, exciting and interesting science can emerge from even the simplest things if you're willing to probe a little deeper. What areas should we explore next? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and I will see you next time for another Bionicle Science investigation here at the Knowledge Tower.